Okay. Um, so, uh, so first of all, I'm sorry about there was no Canvas link for the assignment. I hope that got straightened out. Um, all right, so what I'm mostly going to talk about today, or at least this is the frame, I think, for understanding what's going on in this reading, is Coleridge's understanding of like this cluster of Christian concepts um, that have to do with original sin. Along with original sin also goes the doctrine of grace. And election and reprobation. So, I mean, uh, like, I mean, Coleridge is going to say exactly what he thinks these things really mean. Right? So, but so, but like uh, a rough or like popular way of explaining what they mean is original sin means like um, you know since the fall of man, you know, human beings are um, inherently sinful. And they're not able to overcome that by their own efforts. So, um, so if you do overcome that, it's because God has, without you deserving it, has given you the ability. Um, right. So, I mean, grace really just means that you know someone gives you something that, that you don't have a right to demand. Um, but in this context, it means in particular, God gives you the ability to um, um, to overcome your sinful nature. And um, those who are given that ability are the elect. <laughs> right? So, um, right, those people are saved. Uh, because God gave them that ability to overcome their, their inherent sinfulness. And the other people who aren't given that ability are reprobate. So they're damned. <laughs> um, okay, so like obviously this cluster of concepts is causes problems. <laughs> it's uh, um, 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 it's, it seems strange that these people could be punished for not doing something that they aren't able to do, or that these people could be rewarded for doing something that they couldn't have done unless they got this supernatural aid. Right. So um, so this is the, this is roughly the I mean so like obviously one approach which uh, is uh, um, fairly popular in this time period of the 19th century is to say, well, you know, no, not literally uh, <laughs> right? like no, I mean, really, everyone will be saved in the end. You know, something like that, right? So Coleridge doesn't want to go in that direction, right? Because he's trying to defend the, the he's trying to defend the doctrines of Orthodox Protestant Christianity. Um, and you know, certainly, if you ask what the first reformers had in common, like Luther or Calvin or whatever, I mean, they disagreed, and and this type of disagreement was sufficient to cause wars and whatever about exactly how these things go together. But they definitely all agree that this is really serious. Um, that no human beings can't, by their own action, in any way, deserve salvation. Um, 
So, uh, so, so Coleridge doesn't want to go easy on that, but on the other hand, another approach, which also was popular, or you know, maybe was popular a little bit earlier, was to just uh, really buy into this and say, yeah, every the universe is deterministic. Um, everything happens according to causal laws, and uh, um, God has determined in advance who's going to be saved and who isn't. And uh, that's the way it is. And by the way, anything else wouldn't make sense. So, something like that. so I mean, this that view is actually popular with scientists like Priestley and Boyle. <laughs> um, so Coleridge does not want to go that way either, right? He calls that horrible. So he wants to find some way of defending this that uh, makes it rational. <laughs> so, uh, and it starts with this. Um, so this is on page 262. Um, by the way, again, I hope you didn't have too much time, too much trouble following the reading because of the way it's like, I, did, I should have marked on these pages exactly what was included in the reading or not, and what wasn't. But, uh, um, so, uh, this is on page 262. For the reason in finite beings is not the will, or how could the will be opposed to reason? Actually, he says, how could the will be opposed to the reason? Anyway, yet it is the condition, the sine qua non of a free will. Um, meaning that the will, right? So the will. Not equal to reason. Um, which means that the will, insofar as it's subject to moral law, um, is, so to speak, reason separated from itself. Or it's the spiritual self separated from itself. Um, why do I say that? Well, you know, because on the one hand, the will is uh, originating, whereas nature, which is the object of the understanding, the realm of mechanical cause and effect, and I'm going to go into more de details on all these things further on the lecture, but we, we have, you know, the spiritual is the realm of origins, whereas nature is the realm of cause and effect. So there are no origins in nature, because every cause is an internal effect of some other cause. And this spiritual realm is the object of reason, and this realm of nature is the object of the understanding. Oops, sorry. And um, um, the will is spiritual because it originates Um, the will that's subject to the moral law is spiritual. It has to be spiritual because it has to be able to originate actions on its own. But because it's not the same as expressing this very well. Um, 
it's not the same as the law of the, yeah, I guess put it this way. This is the law of nature, the law of cause and effect. The law of the spiritual realm is the law of reason. This is the law of the understanding. The law of the spiritual realm is the law of reason. And the law of reason is the moral law. So, um, um, so the will belongs to the spiritual, but it's not identical to the law. Maybe you didn't hear that in the past I read, but now I'm going to read it again. For though reason in finite beings is not the will, or how could the will be opposed to reason? Right? The reason, the reason, we can tell that the will is not the same as the law of reason because the will can oppose the law of reason. Um, that is, this lack of identity between the will and the law of reason is the fallenness of the will. It's, um, um, it, it belongs to the realm where the moral law is the law, but it's not necessarily conforming to it. It's not identical to it. And, um, um, uh, so, first of all, Coleridge says, therefore, the term original sin, Coleridge says, this is a pleonasm. Right? Pleonasm means that there's like, uh, it's redundant, right? It's not necessary to add original to the term sin. Why? Because it's not a sin unless it's original. <laughs> that is, unless it's, it's caused by the will itself and not by some external cause. Will so, so, I mean, so right away he's, he's interpreting original sin in an interesting way, right? He's, he's not interpreting it as you know, so like one way of understanding original sin is that that it's the it's the first sin, right? So like Adam and Eve, I guess it was Eve first and then Adam or whatever. But anyway, Adam and Eve uh, commit this one sin, and then everything's screwed up because of that. Um, but that's not how Coleridge is understanding the original and the phrase original sin. He's saying that all sin is original sin. All sin means that the will is originating things not according to the law. Um, but that's also why, and this is the trickier part, he says, this is also why not only sin, but also in a way morality or moral duty itself is a sign of a disease in the will that is of the absence of grace. So this is on page 296. That the law is a law for you, that it acts on the will and not in it that it exercises an agency from without by fear and coercion, proves the corruption of your will and presupposes it. Sin in this sense came by the law, right? So he's interpreting certain, uh, um, as he says, he's interpreting certain uh, phrases in the New Testament where, you know, uh, Paul says something like, it was, by the law, sin came into the world, right? So, which which sounds paradoxical, and some people, as he indicates, want to reinterpret it, right? As he says at the end, like they want to say, oh, you know, by that Paul meant like the the ceremonial law, right? Like the ritual law in the Old Testament. Um, 
So uh, kind of some of us still keep it. But anyway, so like, uh, you know, that's what caused sin, but not, you know, the moral law. How could the moral law cause sin? But Coleridge says, no, that's a complete misinterpretation. If you read carefully, you'll see that it's the law of morality that calls things causes sin. And in what sense does it cause sin? Not like obviously that it makes you sin, but that the, again, as he puts it, the fact that the law is a law for you is a sign that, that your will is corrupt. Right. So that so that, so again, like the fallenness of the will is just the fact that the will is not identical to the law of reason. That it can be opposed to this, that it has its own originating, originating uh, ness that's not according to this principle of the moral law. You try to write moral here. That's what the law of reason is. Um, and um, and so the way he describes the fall on the previous page is this. He starts first of all by talking about irrational agents. In irrational agents, that is the animals, the will is hidden or absorbed in the law. The law is their nature. Right, so this is this is talking about natural teleology, kind of the same way Schelling did. You know, the animal is the working out of a certain purpose in nature, um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't itself like take a position with respect to that purpose. It just is the working out of the purpose. So, uh, and then he says, in the original purity of a rational agent, the uncorrupted will is identical with the law. Nay, and as much as a will perfectly identical with the law is one with the divine will, we may say that in the unfallen rational agent, the will constitutes the law. Right, so the unfallen rational agent would be the one where these two things, will and reason, are still the same. Um, that is, will and law are still the same. And, um, um, and because in this state, the will is identical to the divine will, because it's infinite, right? You can say um, that uh, it's not just the same, it doesn't just, I mean, I guess I put it this way, it's not just the same content as the law, it is the law, right? That is, what the will in this state originates is morality. And then the fall consists in a kind of division between these two parts. So let me keep reading here. Um, But it is evident that the holy and spiritual power and light, which by a prolepsis or anticipation we have named law, is a grace, an inward perfection, and without the commanding, binding, and menacing character which belongs to a law acting as a master or sovereign distinct from and existing, as it were, externally for the agent who is bound to obey it. Um, Actually, maybe I shouldn't have read that part. I mean, what he's saying here is that, therefore, in this state, this isn't strictly speaking to be called a law, right? It is a law as um, uh, 
Locke says and Kant agrees is like uh, a command given by one intelligent being to another with rewards and punishments attached. <laughs> so th this is not a law because there's no need for, need for rewards and punishments attached. The will that's subject to it actually originates it. Um, but actually, so what I actually wanted to read was um, Um, his description of um, what regeneration or election amounts to, this can also be called regeneration, right? Like rebirth. Um, it's, quote, the readoption of the redeemed to be sons of God and the consequent resumption, I had almost said reabsorption of the law into the will. Right? So what election constitutes is um, these two somehow coming back together after the split. I almost, he says, I almost said, I mean, it's interesting. I'm not sure exactly why he, he's like almost said, rather than just saying it. the reabsorption of the will by the law. Actually, no, he says of the law into the will. Right, so that it's no longer something external. So, um, you know, obviously I didn't uh, draw the picture this way by accident. I'm, I'm indicating that this picture somehow is similar to Shelley's picture. Um, this, this split here, so it's a falling of the will, but at the same time, it has a positive result in that only after this can we say that the law is a law for us, or that we know it as a law. Um, so, in other words, original sin as uh, Coleridge understands it is. It takes the place of, or is maybe in a sense identical with what Schelling calls judgment or ortile, right? Remember, I pointed out that the German word uh, for judgment, ortile, seems like it means original division. Um, right? So the original sin is an original division, and it's um, as Shelley put it, for the sake of appearance, right? It's, it's, this division is necessary if we're going to know this as a law. And remember, in the story, the fruit that they eat is the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right, so that's also part of what he's interpreting here. Um, um, and then election, the grace that allows us to, to somehow come back and um, and uh, recognize the law in our own finite will. Um, it's something that doesn't come from our own conscious will anyway. It's like a dark unknown force, as Schelling puts it, right? It's like that force of genius that, um, that Schelling says in the artistic genius, 
allows them to perfect their will their, or the product of their will in, in a way that they wouldn't have been able to on their own. So, so that's roughly speaking what Coleridge is doing with Schelling's machinery here, how he's trying to use it to um, rationalize these apparently irrational Christian concepts. <laughs> yeah. Does he ever specify what kind of moral law he's talking about? Um, like what values are? He doesn't. Well, I mean, he does say a few things about it, right? That it, like it has a negative component and a positive component. And the negative component just tells us to avoid entanglement with this world, and the positive component is about justice and beneficence. So, I mean, uh, uh, but he doesn't go and give a, like a he doesn't he, he didn't write like you know Kant's. Uh, metaphysics and morals, where he goes into all the details of what the duties actually are. I, I, I think he, he assumes that we mostly know those. Well, I mean, first of all, even Kant assumes that we all really already know our duty. Right? That's a priori. You can't, you know. And if we if we did something because someone else told us that it was a duty, it wouldn't count. It wouldn't have more worth, right? So we must already know the whole list. But but beyond that, I think Coleridge thinks that, yeah, if you want to see a list like that, you can read Kant or whatever. Right? So in other words, um, I think it's it's supposed to be, um, we're supposed to know what moral law means, more or less. Now, I mean, that, oops. Uh, that assumption is not going to continue to hold what the other people are reading up, <laughs> right? Like, not with Emerson or Fuller, really, and certainly not with Nietzsche. <laughs> so it's a good question. Um, and well, actually, I'm, I think one of the things I'm about to point out is that even at this stage, it threatens to become a good question to Coleridge, um, because. Um, it looks from this picture like maybe the fall is necessary, right? That the only way to redemption is by way of sin, right? I mean, for, for you know, this split in Shelling was the beginning of self consciousness. And here we're saying it's the beginning of consciousness of a law of reason or something like that. So in other words, if we had just stayed here, um, um, yes, we wouldn't be corrupted, but, um, um, but it seems like we would be uncorrupted because we didn't even know what we were doing. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, did you? Oh, yeah. Um, so, re retro reprobation, reprobation yeah. is that when the will and the reason never end up meeting again? Yeah, apparently. Um, I mean, remember, Schelling also said that we could get stuck basically at a certain stage somehow. I think that's how he's understanding this. Um, so, um, so, um, you know, this, the, the view that the way to spiritual salvation is through sin is like, um, actually has come up lots of times in history. <laughs> um, it's not something that, we, that, that Coleridge is unaware might be threatening him here. I think he's very aware that, that's, that this is tending in that direction. They, it tends towards what basically some form of what's called antinomianism. 
where this known part is the part that means law. <laughs> oh, sorry, is that not? Where I ended up kind of love I ended up here. Right, the Greek word for law is namos, so like an autonomy, and you know. So this um, antinomianism means anti-law, um, and it's basically like versions of this view. At least more extreme versions of this view say that the the way that in order to reach spiritual salvation, you have to actually sin as much as you can. <laughs> and so there were these like secretive cults of people, you know, uh, um, certainly among Jews and Christians, probably among Muslims also, who, you know, or, and probably among pagans also, like these kind of secretive, uh, for obvious reasons, secretive <laughs> cults of people who were like, you know, decided that that um, what was really required for true salvation was like to you know um, have orgies and <laughs> right like, do do whatever things that, that according to the law you're not supposed to. Do. That, that's I mean that also I guess that raises that also raises the question is that really is that really part of the moral law I mean I don't think they said that. I don't think they said that you should steal and kill and stuff. It's more ritual, but I don't know. Anyway, um, so, um, but like, I guess I'd say a less extreme version, of, you know, so like this doesn't obviously point to that. I mean, because the corruption here, like, you know, you don't actually have to sin to be in this state. But that is, you don't have to actually violate the law. It just has to be a law to you. You just have to know it, relate to it as a law that's external to your will. Um, but um, even a less extreme version of this is still. Uh, It heads towards conclusions that color does not come <laughs> up. Um, um, I mean, uh, actually, maybe I should discuss this. I'm just going to talk about Kabbalistic theories of creation. Maybe I should discuss it in a moment after I get more. What he says about the understanding. Well, well, I guess it's coming up right away. Anyway. So, right, like, I mean, uh, so, yeah, I guess I should say, so first of all, it's not like, only that in this will and this reason or law, it's a little unclear how the understanding fits into this picture. Um, but I think the answer is, you know, so like remember the picture I drew or the list I put up last time of the three parts of the book, and the first part is prudence. And that's connected with the understanding. The second part is morality. And the last part is religion, and that's connected with reason. And then the question is, well, what faculty is morality connected with? And he says conscience. So, like, what is conscience? And um, 
what I came claimed last time is that conscience is like this consciousness that the understanding must be subordinated to reason. The understanding is the finite mind, as in Schelling. I mean, he, he takes his understanding of what understanding is basically from Schelling. Um, it's the finite mind that reacts to external stimuli. Um, and that's why it's connected with prudence, right? Like adaptation to, he also calls the under, Coleridge calls it the faculty of adaptation, right? It's the, the mind that knows how to adapt means to ends, even though it can't supply the ends. <laughs> Um, so, um, um, so what the conscience or the knowledge of good and evil knows is that this has to be subordinated to this. That is that, um, you know, that like prudence has to be subordinated to morality, for example. You can't have morality without prudence. Right, you can't have, this is a, a, like a common misunderstanding of Kantian morality, like as if you should never follow hypothetical imperatives. But you can't, well, I, I don't know, maybe I'm assuming you know more about Kant than you do, but like um, if it's, you know, like if it's my duty not to um, kill myself, as Kant says it is, then um, in order to draw any consequences from that, I have to know lots of stuff about, like, from experience about the world and what would kill me and what wouldn't. Right? Like, you know, do I have a duty to drink what's in this glass or not to drink it? Well, it depends what it is and how do I know what it is and how do I know which things, right? So, so that's all like the understanding. And so I, there's no fulfilling moral duties without the understanding. <laughs> but it has to be subordinated to the moral law. So, um, um, so, I think I, I still don't know exactly how to label these lines or how to untangle this this issue, but it's basically like. Um, the corruption of the will, I, I guess put it this way, you could draw it this way, or you could draw it with reason on top and understanding underneath. The will in becoming different from reason, what it's knowing now, the knowledge of good and evil or conscience, what it's knowing is that reason has to be above understanding. Whereas in this state, it didn't have to know that because it was reason. So this separation is really the same as this separation. Um, or it's at least it's the same as the, the knowledge of this separation. This is, you know, I mean, this is related to the problem we had reading Schelling, where like, you know, there's one level of self-knowledge and there's another level of self-knowledge to a higher power and it gets really confusing. I, I, I think it's a version of that same problem and it's, it's confusing me here, but, um, but I still think they go together in a fairly straightforward way, even if I don't know how to draw the diagram. So, um, and the reason I'm going into so much detail about that is that so um, another way, another diagram you could draw would be something like this. This says nature. Oh, you can't see it, right? Because it's got the Part on the screen. Okay. 
Like you could draw this diagram, like spirit or God on top and nature on the bottom. And this is also the same as this because the nature is the object of the understanding. Right? So like Kant says that, Schelling says that, and Coleridge agrees with both of them. Um, now it can be met in maybe a stronger or a weaker sense, but I think um, in, in Schelling it's meant in a really strong sense in, in that like um, the self before the splits um, creates a boundary in itself in, for the purpose of self-knowledge. And that boundary is the fact that there's a world of external things, <laughs> right? So create the creation of the understanding is the same as the creation of nature, basically. Now, um, um, so this is where I wanted to mention these Kabbalistic doctrines that Coleridge is very, very well aware of. And he keeps quoting, there's this guy, Jakob Duma. Um, uh, who like was a main channel for trans transmission of Kabbalistic ideas to Europe from 1575 to 1624. Um, and um, Coleridge often mentions him, usually to like distance himself. Right? He'll say like, um, you know, don't think I'm a bromist <laughs> or bemist. Sometimes he spells it this way. So what is the Kabbalistic doctrine of in Burma that, that Coleridge wants to distance itself from? It's, so it's basically this, that in order to uh, create the world, what God had to do was create a boundary within himself. The world was full of God. <laughs> this, is, this is an idea that's due to it. Uh, Isaac Luria, the 16th century Kabbalist, um, but that the world was full of God. It was full of the infinite light of God, or I mean, that is not the world, but everything. <laughs> That's all there was. But in order to create the world, God had to create a boundary in himself and like absent himself from something. This is known as, um, in Hebrew it's called simsum, but in but you know, it's contraction. I think Bono's term for it was separation. So God like contracts into himself and thereby opens up a space, so to speak. And this space is the world. And um, so like uh, this has obvious affinities with, with this, with what we're talking about here. Yeah. So this might be a little bit off topic, but I heard hell is defined as like a place without God um, or absent from you know, God's presence. So it makes me think of the world being a, a place that God isn't, like it, it, God explicitly is not that. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like, a, well, so in this Lurianic version of it, the conclusion is not supposed to be the world is hell. <laughs> oh, but but that but but that threatens to be the conclusion. Yes, that threatens to be the conclusion. Or to put it another way, it looks like before there was any like notion of Adam and Eve doing or something or whatever, that the creation of the world itself was original sin. Or analogous to it. So, you know, this is a kind of uh, heretical, mystical conclusion that Coleridge wants to avoid. 
Shelly, I think, is not as worried about avoiding something like this. And, um, and you know, so Shelly and Coleridge have both been reading these Christian Kabbalist texts, I guess, again, especially in Skyboma. Um, so it's not just like a coincidence that these things sort of fit together, but, uh, but, but Coleridge definitely is trying to, as I said, distance himself from this. Despite the fact that, that what he's saying is in some ways really close to it. Yeah. Is this uh, idea that what, what they are referring to as doctrines or like the, the man of doctrines, there is this recurring thing like all these like find that they refer to some kind of doctrinist as like an enemy or something. Doctrinist? I don't know. I remember that I know we it's like it's general like when they don't like the idea that they call this person well there's dogmatists yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean so, that's dogmatist so like originally dogmatist was the a dogmatist was the opposite of skeptic right a dogmatist is a philosopher who um who thinks we should believe things <laughs> as opposed to a skeptic who's a philosopher who thinks we should suspend belief. But um, but Kant uh, um, in basically claiming that there's a third alternative <laughs> said you shouldn't be a dogmatist or a skeptic, right? And he referred to his predecessors, his rationalist predecessors as dogmatists or dogmatic metaphysics. So after that time, dogmatist came to be a, um, a critical term in philosophy. Um, but um, so I remember Schelling using that. I didn't go into what he meant by it. When you know, the, like just with it, like with everything else, you know. So Kant uses the term dogmatist in this way, and there's a million different interpretations of Kant, which result in different understandings of what he means by calling someone a dogmatist, etc. I don't remember Coleridge using it that much. But I mean, he certainly would want to avoid being called a dogmatist. <laughs> um, but I haven't seen, well, I mean, you know, the issue in Schelling is to explain why he's so close to Leibniz and yet is not a dogmatist. Um, but I don't see Coleridge being worried about that. But I could be wrong. Um, I don't remember. Maybe he said something about it in the friend you read. Um, yeah, of course, nowadays, I mean, and I don't know, maybe this has a separate history to it outside of philosophy. That when we say someone is dogmatic, we mean they're just like really sure that they're right, not willing to listen to arguments or something. But that's that's not what Kant was, was accusing the rationalists of. It was, um, it was a proceeding without first criticizing your own faculties. That's roughly speaking of dogmatism. Yeah, um, so, okay. Anyway, that's a good question, but it's, you know, it's a little bit off of it. Okay, yeah, sorry. So, um, so like to understand exactly what Coleridge is going to try to do in this situation, we have to look at more into what he says about understanding as well. Um, so, I said he basically agrees with Schelling about it, but he adds some stuff that's really not in Schelling, I think. Um, which is the connection of the understanding with names. So, um, wait, is that right? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. So, <laughs> so let me. Uh, um, Um, 
So what is the understanding or what is the difference between reason and the understanding? And Coleridge, unlike Schelling, gives us a handy list <laughs> of the three ways that understanding is different from reason. Um, so, and it's part of a like argument to prove that they differ in kind and not just in degree. So I guess I said there aren't that many arguments in this book, but there is this one at least. And yet it doesn't seem very, doesn't have much to it as an argument, right? It's just saying there's a list of ways they're completely different, therefore they're different in kind. <laughs> but anyway, um, so the first thing he says is that understanding is discursive. Reason is fixed. So, um, This, this term, well, not invented by Kant, but this is, you know, the way Kant describes our human intellect is it's a discursive intellect as opposed to an intuitive intellect. So it's fixed here ought to somehow be equivalent to intuitive. Um, but, you know, so, so what does that mean? Well, I mean, it means somehow that it's not immediately related to its object, that it has to go through some process to get to it or something like that. So um, um, what is more like, in more detail, what does Coleridge think it means? <laughs> um, and in particular, like, this is always the question about this term discursive. Does this have something to do with language? That is discourse. Or does it just mean, right? So discursive literally just means like running through. So does it just mean it proceeds from one plot to another or something like that? So the answer for Coleridge is well, it's both kind of. This is how he describes the dis discursivity of the understanding. This is on page 223. Um, in a connected succession of names, as the speaker passes from one to the other, we say that we understand his discourse. Um, that is discursio intellectus, discurs right? So discourse discursion of the intellect, discursus from discuro or discuro to course or pass rapidly from one thing to another. So it's what we do in language when we pass from one name to another. Um, but our understanding is discursive because um, it's when we can follow why someone is going from one name to another that so we say that we understand their discourse. Because um, um, to understand his discourse is to understand, uh, and Sorry, the his here is Shelley's, right? But to understand their discourse is to understand um, how their intellect is passing from one thing to another or something like that. Um, that is, it's to understand how their intellect is passing from one name to another because um, the thoughts that the understanding passes between, according to Schelling, are names. But of course, they're not dead arbitrary names. And this is why I say it's kind of both. That they're living words, 
Ray, as I explained to Ray last time, when Ray, when Schelling talks about the relationship, sorry, Coleridge talks about the relationship between symbols and their meaning. In the, it, if it's the proper type of symbol, the relationship is not arbitrary, and the meaning lives in the symbol. So, um, um, the same page. Oh yeah, there's here, it's just the bottom. It is words, names, or if images, yet images used as words or names that are alone subjects of understanding. So the understanding is um, limited to the sensible world. But it's limited to the sensible world, not just in, or not so much in that it can only think about the sensible world, as in that whatever it thinks about, it thinks about as a sensible symbol. Yeah. So understanding is based on like the fluid movement from concept to concept. Um, and is that diametrically opposed to reason, or does it like encompass reason? Or, well, it's like so, like in Shelley, you know, it's it is it is reason made finite, right? So it's um, uh, the boundaries there has to be in it for reason to understand itself, to you know, like come apart from itself and be object to itself. This boundary, um, which always has to be overcome because this thing has to, in the end, it has to be the same as this infinite thing. So we have that we have the infinite self up here, which is reason. We have the finite self down here, which is understanding. This boundary is what allows reason to, to see itself in the understanding, but at the same time, to see itself there, it has to see this boundary as overcome. So, right, like that was Schelling's interpretation or like explanation of why there's time in the natural world. Um, what I'm saying is that Coleridge is also applying that, so to speak, like inside the understanding. Wait, wait sorry, is there? <laughs> Did you have another question about? Uh, not particularly, but just from my understanding of the concept of understanding, it's like a, sort of a synthesis of reason, but having reached a, a, a finite point where it, that can be applied to the sensible world. Well, it's so again, according to Shelley, and Coleridge doesn't. Um, say this as explicitly as Schelling does here, but I think he's still thinking the same thing. There is a sense of the world because there's an understanding. And there is an understanding because reason in its attempt to know itself. Like, um, as Schelling says, in order to be object, an object, something has to be limited. So, Reason can't right like so that's why like originally that's why at the beginning of the diagram they're drawn together and they come apart for the purposes of appearance or self knowledge. Um, they come apart so that the infinite self can know itself, but to know itself, it has to know itself as finite. That right, so that was the that's the whole driving force of like Schelling's system, right? like how that works out. But so, and one of the steps in that was that, so to know itself as finite, it has to impose this boundary. So the boundary actually is its own act, qua infinite self, that is as reason. Um, and, um, um, but then if you ask, well, okay, why is the boundary always changing? That is, why does the understanding confront a series of external 
things that it constantly has to overcome by understanding them. <laughs> and the answer is because reason is trying to know itself as something finite. So what it is is something infinite. So it's trying to know something finite as infinite. That's the very that's the whole again, like you say, that's the problem that Schelling is trying to solve in the system. And it only gets solved for good when we get to the work of artistic genius. But like, I guess you could say the first iteration to the lowest power of solving it is that this, this understanding is both finite and infinite. It's finite because there's always this boundary, but it's infinite because the boundary is always overcome. So it's sort of like uh, analogous to the idea if you have a frog that's weeping like you have a frog and it wants to make it to the end of the meter and it leaps halfway every time. It'll keep on, you know, it'll, it'll go, it'll make infinite steps and get infinitely closer, but it never actually gets to the end because it's leaping halfway. Well, no, because the frog is trying to go infinitely far. Right. right. But the reason is trying to reason is trying to comprehend its infinite self through the, the understanding, right? Which is fine. Yeah. I mean, like somehow those like Zeno's paradoxes or whatever are supposed to emerge from some kind of mismatch between understanding and reason. But, but, but yeah, but you don't have to bring those in. But this really is, this distance, so to speak, really is in, um, because it's, the, it's just the representation of this undivided infinite um, activity. So, um, so it would be a, if we stopped at any boundary, it would be a false representation, right? It would be knowing itself falsely. And yet we have to stop at some boundary. How can the contradiction be resolved? And Schelling says, well, it's resolved because the boundary is always there, but it has no permanence. It's always been no So, um, Right, so that's why the understanding has to pass constantly pass from one thing to another. And, and like I said, that's one understanding of, of discursive, one way of interpreting discursive that doesn't obviously mention language at all, right? It's just, it runs through something. That's the nature of the understanding, it's discursive. But Coleridge is connecting it to um the um, type of representation that the understanding has. So right, like this confrontation with this boundary is, you know, something comes from the outside, which looking at from this point of view, we can really see this is just reason itself imposing the boundary. But from the point of view of the understanding, it's alien, right? So something comes from the outside, and then that understanding meets it and thereby overcomes it. And meets it with its own representation, which is what Schelling, interpreting Kant, calls a concept, right? So that understand actually um, says, uh, so Coleridge's translation of this is usually notion rather than concept. Sometimes it's just concept. Um, so notion or concept, the, um, that's what the understanding like actually knows, so to speak. I mean, see, actually, I mean, I don't think that's the right way of understanding it in Kant. Maybe not even in Schellen, but that's the way Coleridge is understanding it here. And what the understanding immediately knows is a concept, right? What's something that's internal to it. Right, because again, the thing I was reading before it says, um, in all instances, it is words, names, or if images, yet images used as words or names that are alone subjects of understanding. It is what we understand is names. It's 
so what we understand is um, It's a, it's a kind of symbol of something that's outside of us. It's um, um, as he says right after this, in no instance do we understand the thing in itself, but only the name to which it is referred. So, right, I, I guess I mean, you can think of it this way that the understanding, Shelley also does say something like this, that what the understanding actually knows is its own response to the alien stimulus. It doesn't know what's outside of its boundary at all. From, from a higher standpoint, we can know what's outside its boundary, because what's outside its boundary, again, is really just the activity of reason. In other words, reason is the thing in itself, <laughs> but the understanding doesn't know. Yeah. So the, the name would be a symbol of the notion, but it's more of a concept? No, I, so I think what Coleridge is saying is that notions or concepts are named. Yes. Yeah. And that's why, again, I said it's so for Clover to think it's both that, like, if you ask, is it because the understanding goes from one thought to another, or is it because the understanding must express itself in words or language or something like that? Clover is saying it's the same thing. Names or symbols properly used are concepts. Um, yeah, actually, so like farther up to the top of page 223, the name of a thing in the original sense of the word name, and then he gives this really wrong etymology of the word name. So, <laughs> right, I mean, see, so he commits, so name comes from the Latin. Word nomen. And then he connects that with the Greek term noumenon, which means intelligible, or object of the understanding, something like that. Well, this is just wrong because the, the M sound here isn't part of the root, it's part of the participial image. <laughs> whereas, whereas this and is part of the root. So uh, there's, there's really, it's just kind of a pun. It's not the true origin of the name. But anyway, skipping that. So um, the name of a thing in the original sense of the word expresses that which is understood in an appearance. That would replace or make to stand under it as the condition of its real existence. And in proof that it is not an accident of the senses or affection of the individual not a phantom or apparition, right? So whenever the understanding succeeds in knowing something, what it knows is a name. Oh. Um, Whereas reason is not like that. <laughs> Fixed is the opposite of discursive. So, you know, um, because reason doesn't have to overcome its object and meet it with a representation. Reason originates its object. Yeah. So the concept of understanding, the, the barrier in, in the, the sequence of names kind of implies like a discrete 
uh, like series of, of, of notions that you're understanding, but discursive and, and discourse implies more of a continuous sort of like flowing sort of thing. Um. Well, I don't know if that's true of discourse or discursive, but it is, I mean, but it implies continuity. I mean, discourse is divided into, like discourse in the sense of language is divided into discrete units. That's what it's like. Uh, um, but it's true that, um, Coleridge says, um, that um, the law of cause and effect is a law of continuity in nature. Um, but the way he's understanding continuity, so, um, So like, I don't know if you get into this or not, but like a continuous, like when we say this piece of gold is continuous, what we mean is that one concept encompasses all of it, right? Because it's all gold. So we can go through it without changing the concept. So, um, 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 so this discrete series of concepts or names is, um, I'm saying this right. The fact that everything follows the law of cause and effect is what Coleridge says makes it continuous. X Right, this, okay, this is, okay, so this, and this is what he means. So as long as one name applies to whatever is affecting me, that's continuity. And if you ask whether, like, um, it's still running through there or not, um, it's, you know, um, so like Hume says, as long as I have one idea and it's not changing, I don't get the idea of time from it. I just get the idea of uh, like um, unity, <laughs> right? It's only when there's a change that I get the idea of time. So, I mean, without necessarily worrying about whether Coleridge agrees with Hume or not, on that particular point, you can see, you can see why I might say, well, it doesn't really matter. The point, like, as long as it continues without change, it doesn't really matter whether it's flowing or not, whether time is passing or not. What matters is that one thing can come after another. That's why there's time, right? So, but why isn't this then just discrete? And the answer is because there's a law of cause and effect that determines what will happen after what. And that law should regulate the understanding also in its names, right? So, um, um, so the continuity comes in here because there's uh, no room for something else to break into the sequence. 
That, that's right. So that's why the place that the Coleridge discusses this is when he's talking about the fact that there are no origins in nature. Um, Um X continuing my tour, but was it in the footnote? Oh yeah, it's in the footnote at the bottom of two page two fifty seven. The power of subject to the law of continuity, which law the human understanding by necessity rising out of its own constitution can conceive only under the form of cause and effect. Um, so that's what the law of nature is like in the law. So that, and that's why the law of nature doesn't allow, always goes from one thing to another and the understanding always goes from one thing to another according to its own law and there's no space for origination from the outside so if if this if if this implies continuity to you then i think forward to say that's where the continuity is yeah that's it i mean there's probably a lot more to say about that the question of like in what sense there are discrete quantities of things in nature or is really difficult. <laughs> um, but, um, but I think that's enough of that for now. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how relevant it is right now, but um, so I, would, but I, I definitely fully understand Coleridge's system of like determinism, but, or lack thereof. But um, so for like the fall of man, if you say that something that could have not happened. Yeah. See, I think what he's trying to get towards is something like, um, That's what? Me, just bad fun. No, he's trying to get to something like, before it happened, there wasn't a difference between um, what could happen and what should happen. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then after it happened, there's a difference. So if you want to ask about that one event, like, okay, we know it shouldn't have happened, could it have not happened? It's like, that's the splitting off. <laughs> I think something like that is what he's trying to say. So, so I mean, you know, and maybe it sounds surprising that I'm attributing something like that to him, but but remember that Schelling is full of things like that, where you say, you know, like you say, well, original sin must be something that could have not happened because, I mean, this actually was like the beginning of Schelling's practical philosophy was all about this very issue. So like, it has to be something that could have not happened. Otherwise, how can you say that it shouldn't have happened? But on the other hand, if it's something that could have not happened, then, um, um, then it must have been caused by some prior choice which was wrong. So that was the original sin, <laughs> right? Something like that. And then Schelling would say, how can this contradiction be resolved? Well, because, you know, this is the mediating force that, you know, hovers between the two or whatever. Right? So, yeah, so I, so I think his approach is, is, is to try to make that question not answerable. <laughs> Which, you know, which like is probably the best you can do with that question. Because <laughs> it really is true that if you try to answer it one way or the other, you're gonna be in trouble. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, like what would Thomas Aquinas say? What does he say? 
And then he asked that question. I mean, I, I guess it applies to any instance of sin, really. But I mean, just that, well, I yeah, because sin. because so like the Coleridge says, basically every sin is this, right? And not only every sin, but the the, the possibility of sin. Which consists in recognizing the moral law as something different from my will, even if I abide by it, is already this. Yeah, but could it have not happened? Is yeah, I think. I mean, I think someone like Thomas Aquinas would answer that question by making. I don't remember what if I've even seen what he specifically says about this, but we answer it by making lots of distinctions between different senses in which you could say that something could happen, and, you know. <laughs> so, but yeah, but I think Courage and Shallon are going in a different direction here. They want to say that it's that it's above that distinction, and it was before that distinction. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Um, Sorry, so that was a little bit out of order that I was going to. Oh, because I was going to discuss the other things on that list. Should I still do that? Well, I'll just say, I mean, you know. The next thing on the list says that um, um, that the understanding always refers to some other faculty as its ultimate authority. That is either to sense or reason. Whereas reason um, well, in all its decisions, appeals to itself as ground and substance of their truth. Um, right, that's why the understanding in its um, use in prudence is this adaptive power. It's constantly subject to some external authority. Um, Whereas reason is not. So this again is like a claim, and Coleridge actually says this, that in some way reason is more like sense than it is like understanding. Right? Like the senses, you know, they don't um, appeal to some authority beyond the senses to determine what I sense. <laughs> um, so it's that is the senses that I guess at least this is the way he's understanding that Kant's definition of, of intuition as immediate. Like there's no need for consideration. Um, I just see. And he's saying reason is like that. And he does say reason is like that. Right. So again, that second way is I, that second distinction is is really also a way of saying that reason is intuitive, that it's intellectual intuition, that it's so um, rather than a process of thinking and going through and whatever, it's that that has many parts and will never be finished. It's like all there. Um, it's this object is immediately present and, and it's done. Um, or uh, as he says, this is on page 216, I guess. It's um, a direct ask that what reason yields, I guess. A direct aspect of truth, an inward beholding, having a similar relation to the intelligible or spiritual a sense has to the material or phenomenal. Now, I mean, so like that could mean, it sounds like it means we have this superpower of seeing um, supernatural things immediately using our reason. Right? It's like a 
It's like the eye of the intellect, but it's better than a real eye because it can't be deceived, right? It's, you know, so, um, um, and, you know, using that, how do we know what the moral law is? Well, we just look and we see it, moral law. <laughs> um, now, you know, um, If he meant that, there would obviously be a lot of problems with it. <laughs> they, like, I mean, why don't all, we all agree on what the moral law is, for example, just for starters? Um, and what, how can we talk about it together if when you ask me for my reasons, I just say, well, I see them. <laughs> right? But I think if you get into it, more carefully exactly what he means by this. I think that um, he doesn't mean exactly that. It's like it's like sensing up to a point, but it's not like sensing in the sense that it's not passive. It's an act of the will. So um, um, and so this comes out in the way he describes an argument about now, I mean, this is not an argument about a particular question of morality. It's an argument about the whether there is such a thing, right? Whether there is a spiritual law to which you know the will is supposed to be subordinate, despite whatever sensible things are, you know, impinging on it, etc. And um So first he says something that sounded sounds a lot like what I was saying before. He says, you know, well, you know, like when I woke up this morning and I decided to get out of bed, even though I didn't want to, um, I, you know, I saw within myself the fact of free action. So that again sounds like, and when I say I saw within myself the fact of free action, I mean, if that means I observed this sensation of volition and then i observed myself doing something as hume points out how do i get the idea that one had the power to cause the up it's just one was happening right you know so like that is inner sensation understood that way would be no better than outer sensation um so uh but does it mean, no, it's a special super kind of sensation where I actually see the real power directly. Um, and that's what it sounds like. But then he gets to the bottom and he imagines this objection. He says, but may it not be an illusion arising from our ignorance of the antecedent causes? That's exactly what Spinoza says about free will, right? Spinoza says we think we have free will because we know about the results of our action, but we don't know about the causes of our action. So we think our action is free. So right, it's that type of argument that perhaps to Spinoza specifically that he's alluding to here. And his response is, you may suppose this, that the soul of every man should impose a lie on itself and that this lie and acting on the faith of its being the most important of all truths and the most real of all realities should form the main contradistinctive character of humanity. And the only basis of that distinction between things and persons on which our whole moral and criminal law is grounded, you can suppose this. I cannot, as I would in the case of an arithmetical or geometrical proposition, render it impossible for you to suppose it. And there, I think, is where he's saying it's not a theoretical question. So if I come to you and say, prove to me that there's a moral law, there's no argument you can go through that will force me to agree that there is one. But I should agree. <laughs> I shouldn't suppose that. <laughs> right? So that's the kind of like intellectual intuition that we have. It's a function of the will. I think that's what Schelling says, and that's what Coleridge is saying here too. So it's um, um, 
it's because um, the reason the, the the reason that reason is able to immediately know its object is that it originates its objects and um, and the way it's able to know the law of originating objects is or um, The law that governs originating objects should be its own law. It should be the law that it gives itself. So the fallen state is the state where it doesn't um, know that or recognize it. Um, So, um, so, the, so as long as we're at the standpoint of the understanding, that is, as long as there's nature for us, it looks like we're necessarily in this fallen state. Right? This is the state of knowing a continuous series with no origins in it. We don't realize that, um, that, that really, um, there would be no series like that, so to speak, if it weren't for the difference between our will and the law. And this again is where this kind of um, undesirable conclusion threatens. So I think I'm coming back to this. I'm trying to come to the same back to the same place I started from, but with a little more details in place of what he thinks. Um, so, um, and the undesirable consequences that seem to threaten are, I mean, I guess. There's basically two. One that I wrote up is antinomianism, antinomianism, and the other would be Gnosticism. So, like Gnosticism would be the view that um, to be saved is to get out of the natural world and reject it, because. Um, Again, like to recognize the world of nature is to recognize this division, and recognizing the division is the state of sin. And so to get out of it would be to overcome the, the division, so that when these things come back together, we would expect, oh, I erased that over here, but you would expect these things to come back together, that is like spirit and nature. And so there would be no more nature. <laughs> and that would be the goal. So that the spiritual goal would be to, to, to get out of, reject, destroy even the material world. Not destroy it by smashing it, of course, right? But because that would just make it into a different material world. Oh, and I see I'm out of time. So um, um, yeah. Yeah, so all I can say is, I, I think Schelling's solution to and, and I guess, well, okay, and the other antinomian response would be to say that the way to overcome the division is to realize that whatever happens here actually is the result of reason. And in other words, to realize that what looks like sin is not sin. 
And in fact, uh, like what looks like sin has to be reclaimed, like reabsorbed, uh, reappropriated as moral. Um, so uh, that would be a way of preserving the world of nature, but, um, but the result would be that there's no law of morality. So, so Coleridge wants to avoid both of these. And obviously, I'm out of time, so I don't have time to go into exactly how I think this is supposed to work. But I think that his, his response is similar to Schelling's response. But rather than making the work of artistic genius into the finite object, so what that is, so what he wants is a finite, an object that I can regard within the world of nature, which nevertheless is sufficient representation of the infinite nature of the world. And if I can understand that, then these things can be reconciled without eliminating morality or nature. And his, or like without eliminating nature, and the question is, what is that object? So according to Schelling, that object is the work of artistic genius. But according to Coleridge, that object is morality, <laughs> right? That is, so morality is the, um, um, perfect morality is the way uh, we're able to create a symbol that's sufficient to true religion. Um, and again, the fact that we can't be perfectly moral without grace is analogous to Schelling saying the genius can't create this work of art just based on their own intention. Something else has to step in. Okay, that's all and more than I have time to say. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I feel like that lecture was a little bit disorganized, but it's been helpful.